Okay, I think we are getting live. Let me check on my Facebook. All right, so we are live, Christo, now. So hey. we, we have to behave. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can pass me, I'll behave myself, I promise you. Yeah, exactly. Let's just wait a few minutes for everybody to to join our our presentation so it usually takes two to two, three minutes and then we can start huh? so okay. it looks like everything works and we are we are already live which is good i'm gonna open our good so ready we already have some people joining us so welcome everybody we have already 20 people in the room so it's good Let's give them like two minutes more and then we can start, okay? Okay, that's right. Oh, ha hello, Yole. Yole is watching us now, I can see here. Good. Okay, we have over 40 people. Hello, Andy from Rotan. Great, so. Oh, there is a Karim from Egypt. Hello, Karim. Pedro from Argentina. That's from Rata. She's behind me. <laughs> okay. Hello. Matthew from Mauritius. Nice. Just let's wait one minute more because I can see some people still coming. Oh, there's a Chris from Australia. Chris, oh, welcome. That's a <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Harry from Switzerland. Good. So I think we can slowly start. So hello everybody, welcome to our Tech Talk Tuesday. Today we have a Christo. So Christo, maybe you, you can do the job and just introduce yourself a bit to our audience. Okay, yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Semek. And uh, if it's I for the opportunity to talk to you, Semek, and the rest of the world, welcome to everybody. Uh, I've heard the name Chris Serfontein coming up all the way from uh, Australia, uh, ex-South African or a South African living in Australia. So welcome Chris and the rest of you. Well, let me tell you about myself. My name is Christopher Jarsveld. I'm South African born. I still live in South Africa. I'm 56 years old or young, whichever way you want to take it around. I was born in 1964, uh, so I'm a real uh, vintage model already by now. <laughs> and I was born in the middle of South Africa in a province called the Free State. Now, um, that is about any which way you want to go, about at least six to 700 kilometers away from any ocean. So it's man, in the middle of, uh, of South Africa. And... Uh, I am currently living in Sotwana Bay, which is on the northern part of KwaZulu Natal. Uh, we are about 100 kilometers, 80 to 100 kilometers south of the Mozambican border. So we are right on the coast uh, at the Indian Ocean. Um, and then what, what do I do during the day? Well, nowadays in lockdown, I am working from home. We can't dive, but my day job is diving. I own uh, a business and a charter uh, doing training as well as uh, charting, taking divers out called at uh, Sea Explore here in Sotwana Bay. And then my training is from uh, normal entry level diving right through to tech diving. Um, and then one of my main, I would say thing, something that's very, very close to my heart is uh, actually ecology uh, training. To, tell people about the ocean and what lives in and around the ocean. So that, in short, that's me, Semik, that's me. 
It's cool. Thank you very much for this. So, Crystal, the, the first question for you is like usually to, we ask to everyone. So, when and how did you start diving? And how when and how did you start technical diving? Okay, yes. Okay, my story, I base my story on a passion for the ocean. It's not a it's not a story of glamour, it's a it's a story of passion. I love what I'm doing. Now I was introduced to the sport uh, of the you know of diving before 1978. Uh, then I was 14 years old. It was 1978. I was 14 years old, and at that time, you could only start training or do any scuba courses when you're at least 14 years old. But how it happened is uh, we lived in the middle of the free state, far away from the ocean. But we went to the swimming pool just about every day. When we finished with school, finished with homework, we will go to the swimming pool. And then we started seeing when the pool closes at about five o'clock in the afternoon, there's some big guys coming in with long kit bags, carrying something into, you know, into that area. So that one day we actually hide ourselves in the toilets and we wanted to see what these guys are doing. And then we saw them actually taking out fins and mask and snorkel. And that was something new for us. And uh, we then watched them actually playing underwater hockey. And that is how I actually got into the sport of diving. I had to wait until 14. I then did my first course. And that was still called a class four course through the old SEMA system many, many, many moons ago. So only much later, um, in you know, I went through school, I went to the army, and then in 1994, I actually became an instructor. And uh, that was just for me a thing of, I, I'm not just happy with being a diver. I want to teach people, and I started getting this passion about diving. And I, I had to become an instructor to actually tell other people about this passion that I've got. I would say one of the people that really meant a lot in my life, although I actually met him once, is uh, Mr. Jacques Cousteau, or Captain Cousteau. Um, when we were boys, little boys still watching the TV, we saw these programs coming up on Jacques Cousteau and his diving. And that was one of my, I want to be a Jacques Cousteau. Um, yeah, that is, you know, from 1978 to today i've still got that same passion and i live for that passion i love it every moment of it so how about technical diving how how, how did you came up with that being technical diver and a technical instructor yeah the you know uh, i actually moved to um, i actually started my diving school as such in the joburg area uh, Johannesburg, that is in the now called the Gauteng area. But then uh, what we did is we started moving a lot, taking people on diving trips, more your normal recreational type diving. And eventually I spent so much time on the road traveling from Johannesburg area to Sotwana that it just made sense for me to just stop here, stay here, and start working from Sotwana Bay. But in the late also very late 90s, I started actually getting involved in technical diving. Uh, at that stage, still through the CMAS system. And uh, um, I then started doing more and more courses. Um, I had the privilege as well to dive with, uh, um, unfortunately he's not with us anymore, uh, Peter Tim. Uh, and I did some of my technical, a lot of my beginning technical dives with uh, Peter Tim. And then it also it just became from you know diving it to want to teach it and actually show other people. So it was it, it's just a normal thing. I started something and I actually didn't want to stop there. I wanted I wanted to go to instructor level. Good. So you said that now you do teaching and you do guiding the divers, but how about fun dive? What do you do for your fun dive for yourself? No. For yeah, for me being in the business of diving, the, every dive is a fun dive. Now I mostly dive with customers because we've got a charter running, and even if we 
so-called go on holiday, um, we'll maybe do a trip to the Red Sea, but we'll take customers with us. So any dive that I do is a fun dive, but it's always, always with customers. Um, and I'm very, very lucky and uh, fortunate to be able to do any diving in the sense that if I go and dive with someone on a beginner's course, I will be just as passionate as it would be to go and do a sub 100 meter dive. And uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I don't think everybody has got it. I've spoken to so many other divers with that will say, no, you know, it only goes about certain type of diving. And I can't say that. For me, put me in the water. I want to see somebody in life. I want to try and explore and find new things. And, you know, that is my passion. And then also the other thing is uh, I can dive in any ecosystem, whether it's coral reef, whether we're just covering sand, whether we dive on seagrass. It doesn't matter. For me, every dive is an opportunity to learn more about that specific um, ecosystem. Now, if I think of someone that wants to go to a, a, um, a park, I need to look at animals. For instance, here in South Africa, a very well-known place is um, the Kruger National Park. You go to the Kruger National Park and you drive in a car and you look at nature. For me, diving, and it doesn't matter whether it's snorkeling, 13 meter dive or 100 meter dive. Diving is my vehicle to move through the ocean and the ocean is my park. So, yeah, <laughs> anything sounds like, that's diving. Sounds like the recipe for happiness to me, you know? You're a very lucky man then. <laughs> Great. Yeah, you know, Simic, like I'm actually very, very fortunate in the sense that uh, I live my passion. And uh, um, I think it's important that you, you, you live it. And, uh, I've done a lot of dives already. Uh, I've got more than 13, 13 and a half thousand dives. And still, diving for me is passionate. I love every moment of it. That's, that's great. So tell us a bit about the Sodawana. Uh, that, what's the diving like there? Is it like a marine life, night dive, night life, night life, things to see? Tell us a little bit about Sodawana diving world. Okay, as I said earlier, we on the close to the northern point of South Africa when it comes to the Indian Ocean. We're just south of Mozambique. Um, we fall within an area called the Isimangalisu Wetland Park, which is a, a World Heritage Site. And uh, we the diving here is subtropic, so it's all year round diving. And uh, we, we're fortunate to have very, very good coral reefs. And then most of our diving is actually drift diving. So we launch from shore with a boat, um, do drift diving, and uh, yeah, anything from shallow diving, nine meters, 10 meters. And then we're also fortunate enough in Sojuana Bay to have these canyon structures that is uh, uh, very, very close to the... Um, to the shore. So uh, we can do water temperature here is uh, degrees, summer uh, 28 to 30 degrees plus minus, but on the temperature is about 24 degrees Celsius. The other nice thing about Sadwana is we've got a very high diversity of fish holes in the area. And also because it's a marine protected area, the coral is in a very, very good condition. We've got here in Sadwana, in, in our area, 1,305 species of fish, of which 1,234 are bony fish. So if we take sharks and rays out, we've got one, two, three, four, 1,234 different fish that's been recorded here. Um, yeah, and still, it, I always say to people, it's never a list that is complete because every now and again, there's something new happening, new distribution or even new species that we find in the area. When it comes to night diving, night diving in Sadwana is a, because we need to go in from the shore to a shore launch with a boat, 
Night diving, we don't do a lot of night diving. The conditions must be perfect. So you need to be able to launch the boat just before sunset. And then you need to get back in, back to land again when it's pitch dark with that boat. So you can't go through big surf. You need to wait for uh, like really wind stall uh, evenings and the conditions must be perfect. But we do do night dives, uh, but not, uh, you know, if you compare it to like the Red Sea or maybe Indonesia where you can do it every night, no, you can't do it every night. And you need to be a bit of a tough, tough diver to uh, do it here by us with the, the launching at night. Other things that is interesting in our area, this is a destination where you can come to and actually do diving and also enjoy the Africa part of things where safaris going to parks is, uh, is very close to us. For instance, you can fly into uh, Durban Airport, uh, Tingshaka Airport. You can go and visit the south coast uh, at Umkumas area where you can do some shark diving and then travel up to Sudwana and come and do anything from shallow diving to technical diving. And in our area, we've got a lot of parks uh, where you can actually go and visit and see the big five within 80 to 100 kilometers around us. So it's actually a very unique piece of area or place that we've got here in this little Sodwana house. Okay, great, thank you very much. So you've seen this silicon on a few occasions. Can you tell us how hard it is to find that fish? Yes, um, I was fortunate enough to actually see a couple of them. Now, something that we must remember here is that the silicant is on a critical endangered list. Um, firstly, because we actually don't know how many of these silicants are around. So there are very, very strict rules on diving where silicants are. Now, any technical dive that you do, there's always a chance that you can actually maybe swim past one of these amazing fish. Now, for those of you that might not know what a, a silicant is, is it is like seeing a dinosaur that is still running around nowadays. So, and the reason why we say that the fossils that has been found for, with silicates, they're still in the same form as what they were when they found fossils of them. Okay. Now, to actually dive with silicates, you need special uh, permission and paperwork from government to actually dive with them. Now, I was fortunate, as I said, to um, actually dive with them, and I've still got to today. I've got the shallowest recording of a silicon ever seen alive in anywhere in the world. And we got it at 54 meters. And my story on this silicon is, have you ever dived at the wrong place at the right time? Now that day, <laughs> with the, it's actually quite a long story. So I'm not gonna carry on with that story, but we had problems locating the place. The GPS was jumping up and down and it, just couldn't give us the proper place. So it was calling all pockets. We went down and the next thing is there, we found this fish. This fish was seen on the 14th of February, 2004. This is now four years after they've been discovered. We actually found this one. And this specific one is now named Pandora. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's called Pandora is the area in one of the canyons where we found it there's like square rocks that looks like boxes. So box and Pandora, and that's where the name comes from. Now, this specific individual is individual 19. Now, if I can tell you maybe just a little bit about these individuals, each one of them has got spots on them. And these spots sit in different positions. It's like a zebra. Not all zebras have got the same stripes. So they can identify these individuals with the markings that they've got. And to date in our park, we've got 33 individuals that has been recorded of which Pandora was individual 19. And then last year in September, 2019, 
we actually went down on a training dive in uh, Jessa Canyon and uh, three of us actually saw another coelacanth of which we then took photos with a um, like a GoPro type thing. So it's very low quality photos. We were quite far away from these coelacanths. And that specific one um, was actually named after me. That one is now named with the name of that one is Christo because on its tail, it had these white marks in the form of a C. So that one is individual number 33. Okay. Now the last part of this thesis I want to tell you about is the first one was found in 1938 in down in East London when it was netted. That's the first time that we people thought they might still be alive. Then in 2000, they were found here in um, Sotwana Bay. And one of the people that's actually listening now, Chris Sarfontein, was the first ever person to actually take video footage of a live silicon. So he is one of the first ones to actually see it. Um, now, in between, between Port Elizabeth and, and uh, uh, Sotwana Bay, is a long stretch of coast. So I believe they are everywhere along our coast but it's difficult to find them because of the depth that they normally live in. Uh, they, we mostly find them in the sub 100 meter range. So that is, it's not an easy dive to do. And especially here by us where it's drift diving, it, uh, it, yeah, it, it takes a lot of planning to actually go and do a drift dive in the open ocean. Now, uh, during the last bit of last year, I think, yeah, um, was it beginning this year, uh, individual number 34 was found south of Sadwana, actually between East London and South Africa, more towards Mkumas, by also a friend of mine that went recreational diving, and they found one at about 84 meters, 83, 84 meters. So that just shows you that they all along our coast, um, there's more than what we think they are. So yeah, amazing fish to see, but yeah, you need to go and do technical diving to see them. Great. So, seems like you're very passionate about the marine life, aren't you? I love it. <laughs> so, what what is about the marine life that interests you the most? Then, I want to tell you a story, Semek. Um, I want to go back to when I was a little boy. And those of you that can maybe remember uh, movies like your Westerns, the Western cowboy movies. <laughs> uh, of course. Now, my dad was very much into his cowboy movies and cowboy books. And that was the time when Clint Eastwood was a, a real cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> and we would actually go and look at these movies in uh, what we call a driving. So you drive with your car there and you go and sit and you watch the movie. But for me, the end of the movie where after all the fighting and shooting and killing, it normally ends off with these guys either riding on horse into the sunset and they all live happily ever after. Or you see this house that they've built with a fireplace and the family is living somewhere in the bush and they all live happily ever after. So for me, it was about that the exploring I wanted to be a cowboy. I wanted to be out there where no one else has been. And even uh, at school, we were told about Vasco da Gama, Bartolomeas Diaz, those people that were going out on boats to find the new world. Um, and I was very upset because I wasn't born at that time. I was born much later, but I wanted to be an explorer. And it was, I couldn't understand why can I not be an explorer. And it only happened while I was living here in Sudwana. One night I was sitting around a fire and this thing came up in my mind to say, Krista, you know what? Your dream as a little boy came true. You are an explorer. You're an ocean explorer. You've got this whole ocean next to you that you can go and explore. And yes, that is what makes me passionate about it. It's not only about discovering um, new species, um, but there are still plenty of new species around. And uh, 
Yeah, at Sodwana, we've got about three or four species, brand new species, to be um, actually, the papers need to be finished on them. But also, it goes about behavior. It goes about distribution of animals. It goes about distribution depths. Um, so there's so much that we can actually still do and help science by observing what is going on. So for me, um, yeah, it's, I love anything that's marine. I love being an explorer. And I wanna just tell everybody about my passion. And I want other divers to be also just as passionate as what I am about the marine life. And as I said earlier, I've done thousands of dives. And every dive for me is still passionate. I love it because every time I go into the water, there might be something new that's happening. You've been involved in, in finding and identifying new species. How do you do that? What, what's the process like? To... You know, they, once again, the story actually started with me. A friend of mine is also, I think he lives now also in, um, in Australia, Johan Botov. He had a, um, a scuba magazine that he started called Dive Style. And at one stage, he asked me to write little stories about weird and wonderful features of the ocean. And then I would take some of my photos that I've got and I will write little stories about them. I'll research and I'll write. And then the one day I actually posted a photo in the magazine of uh, what we call an Indian Ocean Walkman or a filament fin stinger. And uh, the photo was published, the story, I wrote the story about this fish. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a call from um, Elaine Jemstra. She is with the, what we call the South African Institute of Aquatic, Aquatic Biodiversity. And she asked me, where did you get this photo? And I said, well, I took it at Sodwana. I mean, nothing fancy or anything. I got it at a, a dive for about 50 meters. I saw the fish and I took a photo of it. We then realized that this fish was only seen as far south as Kenya. And it has never been seen at Sodwana Bay. And that is where my whole journey started. I then realized that, you know, there's things that we see as divers, but we somehow need to communicate these things to the scientists. And we can contribute to science by actually getting involved. So my next level that I want to get divers to is not to just be a diver, not to just get wet, but to be citizen scientists we can feed the scientists with information. And all you need to do is you need to do your own courses or the SSI courses on ecology. They've got a, 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 I mean, there's six fantastic courses in SSI about ecology. And after that is just carry on, do more and more of these courses, teach yourself, buy books, read books, do your own research. Have a camera available, take photos of all the species, make species lists, link up with scientists, uh, exchange information. Uh, and that is how you get involved. Um, we have now actually started during lockdown, lockdown. We have revived something that I've been working on for a long time called Ocean Care which is actually a, a system that I want to use for ecology courses over and above the SSI courses, some new courses that we're writing and actually want to teach people about. So get involved, take photos, make lists, talk to scientists, uh, become a, a citizen scientist and uh, be an ocean or a reef ambassador. And that is what we need in diving. And, uh, you know, it, it also goes about conservation. It, uh, the more educated we are, the more aware we are, the more of a conservationist uh, we become and the more information we can give to the researchers. So yeah, once again, this is just a passionate thing. Another nice story I can maybe tell you, my wife, Pietru, is busy doing a PhD on cleaning stations here at Sudwana. And uh, when she started working on cleaning stations, you know, this thing was in my mind, and I thought to myself, how deep do you actually get a cleaning station? And on one of my technical dives, when we did a dive to 70 meters, 
we actually found a cleaning station at 64 meters. A paper was written about this, and this is now the deepest cleaning station that has been recorded. This might not be the deepest ever. So go out there, go and search for things, uh, share it, and you will be amazed with what you found uh, under the sea. Now on the list and carry on. There's just plenty and plenty and plenty of them. Um, get involved, teach yourself, do courses, use the SSI courses. Those ecology courses are amazing. Yeah, so actually I had that question on my, on my list. You partially already answered it. So if someone is interested in the marine biology, what would you recommend to him? What, what courses should he take or what, what papers should he read? What would you recommend for someone who really feels like that could be his thing, the marine biology? Demek, yes, this, um, I think first of all, you need to get that passion. You need to have that interest in marine life. Um, it then also becomes about, it doesn't matter where I dive, as long as I'm in the water and I can see things. Do the SSI courses, do those, there's six amazing courses. There are other courses around all over the world. Uh, buy books, uh, for instance, on fish identification, there's amazing books like the World Atlas of Fish, the World Atlas of Nudibranchs. Uh, do your own research, uh, link up with other organizations where you can get training. And uh, I think SSI is going in the right direction. No, I can't say I think so. I know they're going in the right direction when it comes to ecology. Um, the package they've got out there is a very, very good starting point. And then I think also as, as divers, we need to link up and link divers up with scientists. So once you, you start contributing, it will just be, become more and more of a passion. Um, so reading, self-education, doing courses, be passionate, be in the water, take photos. The list can carry on. If you really yes. want to, <laughs> you will do it. Exactly. Great. Thank you. So let's move on a little bit for, uh, into the technical subjects. So how do you feel about evolution of technical diving in South Africa? In South Africa, we've got very, very good uh, individuals uh, in technical diving. Most of the technical divers are some of the old dogs now, old dogs with old tricks. Mm -hmm. um, but the, it's a, it's sometimes a, I think a difficult uh, line to get in, to get new people into technical diving. But then saying that, if I look at the, the SSI XR range that we've got. I think it's an amazing system once again when you look at XR Nitrox for instance to start getting people using the normal recreational total dive system by adding just a single uh, cylinder, extra cylinder or a sling or a deco cylinder onto that gear and slowly but surely getting them into technical diving. I think it's very very important. We need to build and create new divers. The old dogs are getting old now. We need new, young, passionate technical divers. And I think another thing in South Africa for a very long time, and um, I'm not saying it's like that with everybody, they are very pro-rebreather divers and pro-rebreather instructors out there. But it has also been quite a negative thing from a lot of older technical divers that say, you know, the rebreather this is not the way to do it but saying that again there's some older instructors that has been diving rebreathers for a very very long time and I, I would really like to see the market of rebreather divers in South Africa growing I think one of our problems in our own country is our exchange rate um, in the sense that you know things are very very expensive in South Africa when you import it and I think that might be a bit of a uh, hold back on actually going into, especially your um, rebreather diving. The other thing I think with a, a technical diving, there's a lot of inland places where divers will go and dive, which makes it a bit cheaper for them to go and dive. 
diving at the coast, traveling to the coast, passes, everything like that makes it expensive to dive. Um, and then also the, the facilities. There are not a lot of facilities that cater for the technical divers at the coast. And by that, I'm not saying there's none of them, uh, but there's not a lot. We are one of the, the few. In Spadwana, there are others as well, and there are others in South Africa uh, that caters for that. So you need to have those facilities available. I think it's growing slowly in South Africa. And I think if we really, I know if we concentrate on speci specifically the SSI system and looking at the introduction into technical diving with the XR Nitrox, uh, we will see a growth happening uh, in technical diving in South Africa. Okay, thank you. So we are we are all boys and we all like toys, right? So my question for you is, what's your what's your favorite one? <laughs> yeah, I know you're sure. using a few at least. So what's your favorite one? <laughs> okay, right. For me, there's there's two toys that have changed my diving. The first toy is rebreather. I dive an AP rebreather, and for me that. It's, a, it, it's something that makes it a bit cheaper in the sense of the gases. And I can go and dive for three hours on shallow, shallower depth um, and actually spend three hours looking at marine life. Uh, so for me, a rebreather, that is one of my better toys that I invested in. And then I would say for me, the most important toy is a camera. Because with a camera, I can take pictures of the marine life that I see down there. So I can collect uh, information. I can use that information. I can share that information. And for me, the camera that I'm talking about here is not those big things with all the big lights. I like to have a smaller handheld type camera. I specifically use the Olymp at the moment at the moment the Olympus TG um, camera. I've got a TG5, and I must say I think it's an amazing camera. And uh, yeah, those are my two toys. I would say, and something that I can maybe just also mention when it comes to cameras nowadays, everybody has got a cell phone, and there are amazing housings that's available for cell phones that you can actually take it underwater. So to start off by taking pictures and getting involved in ecology and collecting photos, you don't have to go and spend thousands of bands. You can actually just use your camera in a, in a housing. But then I want to tell you about another toy. Now, this is a big toy for big boys. I want a submersible. Is what is A submersible. Okay. A submarine. That is what I want. Okay. This, no, you go and look on a place called U Boat Works. That okay. is my dream, Semek. That's my dream. I want to go and spend underwater. You can go down with that submarine 200, 200 meters, spend seven, eight hours there at one atmosphere, and come back up again. Now, there's only one thing that stands between me and that submarine. And that's money. Of course. That's, you know, I, that's my dream. <laughs> that's, that's great. Uh, actually, I, I can give you a contact to one guy around my area who actually built one and he's actually diving with it in a lake in Poland. I've seen it under the water. It was on 15 meters, but he really built one and he's actually diving. I can give you a contact to him. Maybe you guys can get together. Yeah, Great. I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> that, would be, that would be fun. So I have a one more question for you only, but I think that would be a nice one. So where would you like your diving to take you in the future? The place you would like to see or your personal goals? What, what, what that would be? As long as diving takes me into the ocean, I'm happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, not far, so not far away from your place then. <laughs> <laughs> anywhere, Semek, anywhere that I can dive. I, for me, it goes about the passion to be in the water. Where I would like to see things going in my life 
um, I would like to not only leave a legacy behind, I want to live that legacy with other people. And that is getting people more and more into marine education. And then once again, you know, marine education and diving the marine life can be from recreational diving to technical diving, going sub 100 meters. Um, there's so much that we need to go and explore. So for me, it all goes about that passion and I wanna share my passion. Um, I would like to see people getting more, become more ocean ambassadors or reef ambassadors, become more of a citizen scientist. Um, and I've got a couple of, I would say wish lists um, that I would like, or animals that I would like to see. And uh, one of them is actually a sea dragon. Those, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> those little, uh, what do you call it? Like your hippocampus type dragons. Your, uh, you know which one I'm talking about? Your sea dragon. I think you find them in Indonesia. Right. That I would love to see. I would love to see uh, manatees alive. And I would like to see dugongs uh, alive. And uh, these are animals that's really under threat because of overfishing. It's also because of uh, ways that people fish on nets being dragged. And then if I can maybe, I don't like cold water, um, but uh, if I, I would like to do one uh, ice dive. I would like to go and do it either, you know, maybe at, in Antarctica or one of those places. So if I can ever get the opportunity, opportunity to, to see that world, I think that will be amazing for me to see it. Um, but yeah, uh, personal goals, I think is yeah, marine education. And then, you know, I always say to people, I want to live to dive tomorrow again. Um, so it's about staying safe, staying alive. Uh, technical diving for me is not only about getting to the depths of the technical dive. It's getting back and getting back safe to be able to tell the story and to dive again tomorrow. And that for me is, yeah, I think it's, it's just passion, passion, passion. And as I said in the, in the beginning, my story and where I would like to see my diving going is not a, a story of being a macho. It's a story of being passionate. And I want to share my passion with each and everybody out there. Uh, enjoy the ocean. Have fun in the ocean. Keep on diving and be safe in the ocean. That's, that's great. That's, thank, thank you very much. We have, a, we have a question from Tracy. Other than South Africa, where is the best diving you would like to go and see? Where? Other where than is South Africa. Yes, other than the best place to go yeah. down. Yeah, other than South Africa, of course. Where would you like to go diving the most? Oh, outside South Africa. Outside South Africa, yes. I, I've never been to Indonesia. So I think that will be... Um, would be one of the places that I would like to go and see is uh, Indonesia because of the, the coral triangular that they're talking about. You know, that's where most of the coral, most of the fish uh, actually occur. So I would say, yes, that would be definitely my number one at this stage. And uh, we are looking at actually planning trips to that area. Um, yeah, I would say Indonesia. Good. It's a nice place. Okay, Crystal, thank you very much for, for, for your talk. I, I can see that, you know, the passion for diving is coming all around from you. So it's really, it's really beautiful to see this kind of people. Thank you very much for sharing this passion with us here. It was really nice to hear those stories you told us. Thank you, Semek, and thank you for the interview. Uh, Corona, for what you did there in the background as well, uh, SSI. Um, yeah, and it was, a, it was, it was an honor actually sharing my passion with everybody that has listened. And thank you for listening to me. Great. So stay healthy, stay safe, and let, I, I hope we see each other under the water next time, or maybe on the airport and then under the water.
Definitely. Looking forward to see you again, Semek. <laughs>